So, school. School kind of stinks, doesn't it? Spend all this time trying to absorb all this information, demonstrate knowledge on a test, write, 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 read, 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 learn, 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 and all for what? Really? Isn't this just draining your life of other activities that you, you know, could be doing, having a lot more fun, being a lot more productive? So screw school. Let's be done with school. What's the purpose of life? Well, I'll tell you what would make life a lot easier and a lot better. Money, 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 money. Wouldn't it be great just to be a millionaire and be able to do whatever it is you want to do? All right, so let's do it. Let's get rich. Let's learn how to get rich so that we can just say, nah, I don't need school. I don't even really need a job at a certain point of time because I'll just have money and be able to do whatever it is I want. All right, so let's get rich. Well, one way to get rich is through investing. Remember that Andrew Carnegie, when he was a very young fellow and he discovered investing, he said, behold, I have found the goose that lays the golden egg. All I have to do is have a little bit of money, some basic capital, invest it in a company. The company grows. I sell my shares of this investment and I get this money back and I get more money back than I put in. And what did I do? What did I do? Nothing other than, well, wait for a period of time. That was it. Money and investing, a way to get rich. Yeah. So let's learn how to do this. All right, so let's do this. Let's figure out how we can get rich through investing. Okay, so first of all, let's just understand uh, in general what an investment is. Here is an informal definition of investment, of what an investment is. When you invest in a company, you are buying a share of that company. So when you invest in the company, you own a fraction of that company. Now you buy up enough shares of that company, then you might actually be able to run that company, but we're not gonna do that. Our goal here is to you know, get rich, not to run a company. Okay, but the idea behind invest, investing is, at least the idea of it, it's fairly simple. If a company decides to become a public company and allow for anybody to invest in it, then the job of that company is to take the money of the investors and to put it to good use so that the company grows and becomes a more profitable company. So if you're a company that, well, let me just make something up here. If you're a company that makes t-shirts, right? You're a t-shirt company and you become a, a public company where anybody can invest in you and you get a million dollars of investments, well then you can use that million dollars to create more t-shirt factories, more t-shirt stores, sell more t-shirts, you become a more profitable com company, and you grow. And then the investors are happy, and if they decide they wanna sell their shares, then they cash out and they get more money back than they put in. It's ideally a win-win. Okay, but our goal here, we need to get rich. We need to get rich. So what do we do? Okay, we need to find a company that we're pretty sure is gonna grow and grow substantially. Now, what I wanna do for you is this. I wanna turn you into a millionaire in 10 years. So 10 years from now, I want for you to be a millionaire. In order to do that, we need to find a company that we can invest in that is growing substantially and we feel certain will continue to grow substantially over the course of the next 10 years. All right, so take a moment, try to think of a company that's doing really good right now and likely will continue to go to do good in the future. Try to think of a company. Well, how about this company? Amazon is a company that is doing extraordinarily well right now. This online retailer became a public company that you could invest in in 1997. At that point in time, if you wanted to buy a stock in Amazon, that stock was really cheap. It was about $20. Today, Amazon stock has risen to above $3,000. So in other words, if you put 20 bucks in Amazon in 1997, today, in 2020, you could cash out that share and collect over three grand. Imagine if you put $10,000 in Amazon in 1997 and then just waited a little over 20 years, you'd be a multimillionaire. So Amazon, let's bet on Amazon. And that's really how you need to think about investing is it's betting. All right, so here's the worth of Amazon stock over the course of Amazon's life from being born in 1997 to today. And I am recording this lecture 
on December the 14th, 2020. And so the graph there really shows you how after, well, about 2010, Amazon stock just started growing exponentially. And what's really amazing is, as I recorded this lecture, in between the time that I opened the window to get the current price of Amazon stock and the time it took me to take the screenshot of this, this the worth of the stock grew. So check this out. If you look at the far end of the graph, I rolled the cursor to the far end of the graph to get the most recent update at the time that I opened up this window. And so the worth of Amazon stock was, on the morning of December the 14th, 2020, $3,188.27 for one share of Amazon. And so I left the cursor on there so I could take the screenshot so I could get that number. But if you look at the top of the screen and you see the number in black, that number instantly updates. And I was only on the screen for about a minute or two, just sort of looking at it. And the number that updated went up over a dollar. So hey, yeah, Amazon's growing. And the number on the top is $3,189.59, a little over a dollar from the number that you see there on the far right. So, okay. And of course, Amazon isn't always growing in an upward trajectory. As you look at the graph, there's some up and downs there, but generally it's going up, 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 up. Now, will it continue to do this? Because if it does, we can make money. All right. So let's start here. In December of 2020, one, stock, one share in Amazon stock is $3,188.27. 10 years ago, in December of 2010, the price of one share of Amazon stock was $175.65, which means that over the course of the last 10 years, one share of Amazon stock has grown 18 times. That's substantial growth. So if we assume that Amazon continues to grow at the same rate, and that's, of course, an assumption, but if we can assume this, and we're aiming to become a millionaire in 10 years, so in December of 2030, then how much do we need to invest today? So in other words, we start with a million dollars, we figure out what one eighteenth of a million dollars is, and that's what we'd have to invest. So in other words, approximately $55,000, or excuse me, $55,556 we invest this in Amazon now, wait 10 years, Amazon continues to grow like it's grown in the past 10 years, come December of 2030, we're millionaires. Woohoo. So, okay, this sounds pretty good. But you look at that figure and you're like, all right, that's pretty awesome, but we still have to come up with the 55,556 bucks and we might not have that in our back pocket. Well, how do we scrounge that up? Okay, that's true. You know, fifty-five, fifty-six thousand dollars $56,000, very few of us have that type of money readily available. So now the question is, well, where do we get the $55,000? Well, let me make an, a comparison for you. In a few years from now, many of you will want to go to college, and some of you may have sticker shock at how expensive college is. Let's compare numbers. If Amazon continues at the same trajectory that it's at right now, and we want to become millionaires in 10 years, then we have to invest over $55,000 into Amazon. If you are graduating from high school this year, and you want to spend the next four years at Ohio State, and you don't have any scholarships, well, four years at Ohio State is going to cost you over $100,000. So where are you going to get the money to go to college? Well, you're probably going to have to go to a bank to get a loan. And then after the four years of college at Ohio State, you're going to graduate and you're going to have to pay that loan back with interest, which means it's going to be more than the $100,000 that you took out. So let's just stop here and let's think about the better way to use our money. You could get a loan from a bank to invest, and hopefully it's a good investment. Ten years down the road, you become a millionaire, you pay that little bit of money back, and you live a grand old life maybe investing even more in the future and getting even richer in the future, or you take a loan out of a bank, you go, in, you go to college, you end college in debt, you hopefully get a job that helps you pay off that debt, but no guarantee. You could become one of the tens of thousands of Americans who accumulate significant debts because of your college loans. So as you look at these two options, and you're only thinking in terms of, well, let's make money, which one is the better option? Okay. So let's say you decide to go with the investment option. 
They're like, okay, I just need to get a loan from a bank for $55,000, 556. Sorry, let me say this right. We just got to get a loan from the bank for $55,556, get that loan, invest it in Amazon, then stay alive for the next 10 years, you know, get whatever job you can, probably live in an apartment, you know, make enough money to kind of keep yourself going. And then in 10 years, cash out and become a millionaire. All right, woohoo. Let's keep going with this. Okay, so you need to go to a bank to get a loan. You don't have the 55 plus thousand dollars, so you're gonna go to the bank to get that money. All right, so the bank might be willing to go along with this. They might be willing to give you this loan. They give you the money, you invest it, you wait for that investment to grow. In the meantime, you're gonna probably have to pay back the loan, give a little bit back every month. So you probably will have to get a job over the course of the next two years or excuse me, over the course of the next 10 years, paying this loan back little by little by little. But that's okay, because you're still gonna be a millionaire in 10 years. Now the bank, they're gonna wanna make sure before they give you this loan that you are not a substantial credit risk for them. They look at you and they see somebody who's a teenager, and they might think, mm, I'm not sure if you, kid, are reliable enough that you're gonna pay back this 55 plus thousand dollars. So before we give you this loan, we're gonna need somebody to co-sign for you. Somebody that actually has money so that if you default on this loan and you can't pay us back, we can then go after that person and force them to give us the $55,000 back. So naturally you call upon your parents. Mom, dad, will you co-sign this loan? I wanna become a millionaire. And let's say your mom and dad go along for it. They're like, all right, we'll do this. So the bank evaluates your parents and says, you know what? We're willing to give this kid the loan because his parents co-signed. And parents, the parents have property. They own a house, a house that's worth far more than $55,000. So now you get your loan because your parents co-signed on it. They own a house. They likely have jobs and a substantial income and all is well. All right, now let's look at the bank's perspective here. Where does the bank get its money from? Okay, so a bank is, well, a bank. People have savings accounts at banks. They have checking accounts at banks. People put money into a bank. Okay, but what's important to know is that when you put money into the bank, that money doesn't necessarily stay at the bank. The bank then uses this money to give out loans. Loans for cars, loans for houses, loans for college, and in this case, loans for investment. And the reason why the bank gives out those, that money is because those loans must be repaid with interest. Therefore, the bank makes a profit. So the bank has something to gain from this as well, assuming that you are not a credit risk, which thanks to your parents helping out, you're not. The bank's on the way to making money. You're on your way to becoming a millionaire. Your parents co-signed, but if you become a millionaire, they couldn't be more proud of you. Life's looking pretty good, and you're on your way to getting Filthy, stinking, rich. Woohoo! Pretty exciting stuff. So this is essentially what was happening in the 1920s. If you're thinking about this stuff and thinking, yeah, you know, investing is a great way to make money. Look for the companies that are doing really well, or better yet, be able to accurately predict which countries, or excuse me, which companies are sort of no-name companies right now, but they will become big companies later. Find them and invest in them. You invest in them, that helps them out. You make a bunch of money years down the road. It's very exciting stuff. And if this stuff intrigues you, well, maybe you want to consider a career in investment banking someday. So in the 1920s, back to the 1920s, stock market's doing great. Andrew Mellon, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, had helped to encourage this growth by allowing and encouraging people to buy things on credit. This was the whole buy now, pay, buy and pay later philosophy. So you could buy a refrigerator or a car or a house with money that you did not yet have. Buy these things on credit. With the help of a bank, you pay the ba bank back with interest. Now, when you did this with stocks, this was called buying on the margin. And a lot of people did this in the 1920s. They bought stocks with money they didn't have. Just like if you don't have $55,000 to invest in Amazon and you get a loan from the bank, 
assuming that Amazon stock is going to continue to grow, you're easily going to be able to make that money and give it back to the bank. You are still buying stock with money you don't actually have. And that's what a lot of people were doing in the 1920s. They were buying on the margin. And you see this really substantial growth in the American stock market in the 1920s. Things are just growing and growing and growing and growing. And can it continue to grow or will this bubble pop? And if it pops, how will it pop? The most famous stock market crash in American history happened in October of 1929. Why did this stock market crash happen? Well, that's a very complicated question to answer. There were several factors, and I am no great economist or economic historian, but the easiest way to understand the stock market crash of 1929 is this, or rather it's like this. There was a loss of faith in the American stock market. It first began with international investors who knew that a lot of Americans were buying stock on the margin. And by the summer of 1929, some of them began selling their stock because stock had done so well, it had grown exponentially, and there is this sense that it can't keep going up, might as well cash out while we're ahead. And so many of the international investors pull out, the stock market begins to go down, and everybody sees the stock market starting to go down. Now, if you're one of these investors who's bought stock on the margin, and you see the stock prices, all of them, starting to fall, how long do you wait before you cash out? When all of these investors all start to get really nervous, then a panic ensues. And that panic happened over the course of about half a week in October of 1929. People rushed to sell their stock. And when everybody rushes to sell their stocks, this crashes the stock market. This was the panic and the stock market crash of October 1929. Now, I find this particular event interesting to think about on two different levels. One is the level of the nation as a whole, or rather the stock market as a whole, and then the other is the level of the individual. The stock market crashed because there was a loss of faith in the stock market. Everybody said, okay, the stocks are inflated, too many people have bought on the margin, we need to sell our stock and cash out. And when they did that, the stock market crash became a self-fulfilling prophecy. The panic created the crash. So let's say there wasn't a panic. Let's say everybody, you know, learned the news that, okay, most people are buying stocks on a margin. All right, so what? Everything's working. Let's just, everybody leave our stocks in there and nobody cash out. Well, if there had a, if that had to happen and there wasn't any panic, then there's, then there's no stock market crash. So if everybody just as a whole had have somehow collectively agreed, hey, we're not going to sell our shares, we're going to hold on to them, we're going to keep our investments, likely everything would have been fine. There would have been no stock market crash of 1929. So on this level, you could think as a group, why didn't they just everybody agree to keep their money in? But that's the thing. People don't think like this. It's very difficult to think like this in terms of the collective good. Most people just think about themselves. So if you now think of yourself as an individual, if you have an investment in the stock market and that stock, stock market's going down and down and down, are you really going to think to yourself, you know, I don't want to become part of the problem and rush to sell all my stocks. That's going to contribute to a stock market crash. Or are you going to think, oh my God, the stock market's crashing. I got to get my money out now. I don't want to lose everything. Chances are pretty good that you're <laughs> going to follow the latter. You're going to do the second thing. You're going to rush to cash out to save yourself, to save your family, so that you're not one of these suckers who watched the stock market crash and did nothing and lost everything. So the stock market crash of 1929 happened because there was a loss of faith in the stock market. There was a panic, and individuals who had invested in the stock market saw the price of their shares of stock dropping quickly and driven by a sense of self-preservance they rushed to sell their stock too, which contributed to the overall problem. And this was the stock market crash of 1929, October. Most historians mark this event as the beginning of the Great Depression, the worst economic depression in American history, 
which will last approximately 12 years and will only end when the United States of America enters World War II in 1941. Now, the stock market crash was sort of the first part of this economic disaster. So now think about this. If people had gone to banks to get loans from banks to buy their stocks, and most of the people weren't able to sell their stocks in time, this means they still owe the banks. But if they're broke, then they can't give the banks any money. And the bank might be able to confiscate their house or their car or something, but what if then there aren't any buyers for the houses and the cars? Now it looks like the banks may collapse. And let's say you have your life savings in a bank. Well, now you're going to rush the bank. And this was particularly sad because there were quite a few people who had spent their lives doing what they were expected to do. They worked hard and they saved their money. And what do you do with your savings? Well, you put your savings in the bank. Now you find out that that bank might be go losing all of its money. It might be going bankrupt. So you think to yourself, all right, quick, get to the bank, get in line, get up to the bank teller and withdraw all the money. So this is very similar to the panic that happened on Wall Street because you can think to yourself, well, as a group, if all of these people just had said, okay, let's all not panic. Let's just, everybody's, you know, stay at home, keep your money in the bank. Let's all not flip out here. Let's not rush the banks. If collectively people had, to deci had have decided to do that, well, then probably many banks would have survived and the depression might not have been as bad as it was. But that's on the level of the group. But people, I mean, imagine if you were one of these people, they're thinking in terms of their own self perseverance. They want to take care of themselves and their money. And they don't want to be the person who stays at home while everybody lines up to withdraw money from the bank and then the bank closes and shuts down and the bank has no money left and that was your money you put in the bank. There's now nothing to withdraw. There's now no bank to go to to get your money back. Your money is now gone. You don't want to be that sucker. So you become part of the bank rush and you as an individual contribute to the problem. So first there's a stock market crash and then there's a bank rush. And then there's a Great Depression. The worst year of the Great Depression was 1932. Herbert Hoover was the president of the United States of America. A good Republican like Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge before him, he believed that the business of America was business and that business and industry would help to solve the problems of depression. That it was not the job of the federal government to get involved. But in 1932, which was an election year, 25% of Americans were unemployed. Because of Herbert Hoover's largely do-nothing attitude, when it came to the Great Depression, he will not be reelected in 1932. And instead, a Democrat will be elected under the expectation that he will get the federal government to do something to provide relief and opportunity for all of these Americans who are struggling. This was not an uncommon sight in the early 1930s. This particular picture was taken in Seattle, Washington. Here's what you're looking at. Think about our little thought experiment about investing in Amazon. Well, let's say you did this, and let's say your parents co-signed the loan for you, and part of your parents' collateral was their property, their house. And then let's say a stock market crash happened. You're one of the many who is not able to get out in time. Stock market crashes. You've got nothing. You can't pay the bank back. The banks are struggling. They say very well, we're going to take your parents' house. Now you and your parents are out on the street. Where are you going to go? Well, you might follow the hundreds of other newly homeless people, go to a city park, take it over, scrounge up whatever materials you can to make yourself a little ramshackle home and try to survive like this. That's what you see here. The people that are living here in this shanty town, they call these shanty towns Hoovervilles after the president of the United States. They likely, the people who live there or lived here in this particular image, they likely had jobs and houses and cars and had invested a whole lot into the stock market or had kept their savings in a bank and then lost it all. Banks confiscated homes, evicted people. Banks had to do that. Economy crashes, businesses close, people lose their jobs. People who once had very stable livelihoods were now homeless and living in places like this. So that is the story of the stock market crash of 1929 and that 
is our introduction. It's one of the most terrible times in American history. This is the story of the Great Depression of the 1930s. United States history students, let's learn the story of what our country went through during the 1930s. It was one of the darkest periods in American history. This is the story of the Great Depression. And how I would like to present the story of the Great Depression is through the eyes of one individual. She is one of the most important people in American history. She was the first lady of the United States of America throughout most of the Great Depression and the Second World War. This person was Eleanor Roosevelt. I'm going to go a little in-depth with her personal biography, so you will learn her story, and we'll learn her background, how she grew up, the experiences that she had that led up to the Great Depression, and how those early influences helped to shape her perception of the Great Depression and her activism during the Great Depression. So let's learn the story of Eleanor Roosevelt. So this name, Roosevelt, we've heard it before. We've already gone in depth with the life of one Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. So Eleanor Roosevelt was the niece of Theodore Roosevelt, which means that Eleanor was the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt's brother. So here you're looking at Eleanor Roosevelt's parents. And already we're going to get a sense of how Eleanor's personality was shaped. Let's start with Elliot, the younger brother of Theodore Roosevelt. Elliot, like Theodore, grew up in Manhattan to a wealthy, prominent Manhattan family. Now, Theodore, you already know his story. He starts living a strenuous life, living out in nature, spending a lot of time in nature, trying to overcome his asthma. He loves science and adventure. He grows up always seeking adventures and challenges. And Theodore was very unique in that way. Theodore Roosevelt's a very you know, different and unique type of human being. Elliot is a little bit more what you would, would expect with uh, the son of a wealthy, prominent New York man, you know, that being Theodore Roosevelt Sr. Elliot was not as much of an adventurer as his big brother Theodore was. I mean, really, who is? Elliot was more what you'd expect from a rich Manhattan family. He was a socialite. He liked dressing up. He liked nice parties. And he also enjoyed the company of beautiful women, which is how he met his wife. Another socialite from a wealthy family, her name was Anna Hall. So Elliot and Anna met, they're wealthy, they're established, she is by all accounts beautiful, so they get hitched and they make a family. They have four children, one of which is of course Eleanor. Eleanor's full name was Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, named after her mom, but she went by Eleanor so that there wouldn't be two Annas in the home. Now sadly, there was not a good relationship between Eleanor and her mom, Anna. Anna was this tall, beautiful socialite, and she had the values of a beautiful socialite. The goal in life as a woman is to be beautiful, to be sophisticated, and to marry a rich man, which is exactly what she did with her life. And she looked upon Eleanor, her daughter. And when Anna looked upon her daughter, Eleanor, she saw a little girl who was painfully shy, awkward and had big teeth and the mom was so mildly disgusted with her daughter that she made fun of her. Eleanor's nickname while growing up was Granny. As a young girl, Eleanor was told by her mom that she looked like an old woman. So needless to say, Eleanor did not have a good relationship with her mom, so she went to her dad. Her dad was very loving and very comforting to Eleanor, and he loved Eleanor greatly. It was a great daughter-dad bond that the two of them had. But Elliot has one problem. Alcohol. Elliot truly struggled with alcoholism throughout much of his short adult life. We only have these pictures of Eleanor with her parents when she was a really little girl because both of her parents died young. Eleanor's mom, Anna, died when Eleanor herself was only eight years old, her mom died of diphtheria. She was only 29. Bereaved by the loss of his wife, 
Elliot responded predictably by drinking a lot. His alcoholism became so severe that he died only two years later when Eleanor was 10. He was only 34. Eleanor was only 10 years old when she became an orphan. Eleanor was picked up by her mom's mom, her maternal grandmother, to raise her throughout the rest of her childhood. And Eleanor Roosevelt is a case study for how the lives of the rich aren't always pleasant. Eleanor Roosevelt, she was a Roosevelt. She came from a family with a lot of money, but there's not a whole lot of happiness in the story of the young Eleanor Roosevelt. But, and this is what makes the story of Eleanor Roosevelt fantastic, hers is the story of resilience. After multiple emotional traumas throughout her life, Eleanor seems able to use those traumas as part of her story, as part of her experience, and to not let those experiences break her, but to use them as inspiration to living a better, meaningful life. There's a great and rather famous Eleanor Roosevelt quote that relates to Eleanor's experiences from childhood, and that quote is this, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. There is in Eleanor Roosevelt's life this element of choice. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I can choose how to respond to even the most painful events. Now, in her late teens, she's still being raised by Anna's mom, her maternal grandma, so she's still very much this New York socialite. And one of the common rites of passage for rich kids who grew up in the American Northeast like New York, was to spend a year abroad and study in Europe. So Eleanor went to England and spent a year studying there with other wealthy Americans and British kids, or kids probably isn't the right word there, young people. It's still the socialite scene, it's just in England. And Eleanor never really felt like she fit in. So when she returned home to New York City, she decided that she wanted to follow in the footsteps of another woman from that era that she greatly admired, Jane Addams. You remember Jane Addams. She founded the settlement house Whole House in Chicago to take in mostly orphaned children, provide them with a home and education, and give them the opportunity for a good life. And there was something about that that Eleanor thought, yeah, that's what I would like to do. I would like to be like Jane Addams. I would like to help the poor children, not of Chicago, but of my hometown, New York City. So as a young woman in her late teens, Eleanor Roosevelt got a job working at a settlement house on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and what she saw and the experiences that she had there truly upset her. These experiences woke Eleanor up to the fact that even though she had really not the best childhood, it was still a privileged, a privileged childhood with a lot of wealth and a lot of comfort, even if not emotional comfort. Eleanor at least knew that she always had a fine home to live in with fine clothes, and she never had to worry about where her next meal was coming from. And it horrified her to know that there were children who had to live in squalor, who had to live in the cold, who didn't have good clothes, who didn't have access to food or good nutrition. And this experience that Eleanor has in her late teens begins to inspire Eleanor for, to what she's going to dedicate her whole life to, which is helping those people from all backgrounds, from all walks of life, who didn't grow up with the same privilege that she had, so that they can have security and opportunity too. And it really began for Eleanor when she was working in the settlement house in New York City. As she herself later said, I had my first introduction to the conditions of labor while teaching at a settlement house on Rivington Street in New York City. I had never known anything about sweatshops or how things were made that you saw in shop windows. I was being educated. I saw little children being worked hours on end until they fell off the bench asleep. This was all completely new to me. This was my introduction to labor and labor conditions. Eleanor Roosevelt is being educated by the poor on the streets of New York City, but she's also still a Roosevelt, so she goes to this institution to also get educated, Harvard. This is where all of the Roosevelts go. It's where Theodore went, it's where Eleanor went in the early 20th century, and it was here at Harvard where Eleanor met another Roosevelt, her distant cousin Franklin, and the two fell in love. Now, before you get too disgusted by this, two cousins falling in love, please understand that they were very distant cousins. They were five generations removed from each other. So yes, they, they shared the same great, great, great grandparents so that's pretty far removed, but they both still have the same last name. 
if they didn't have the same last name, it would probably make it a lot less awkward. But what a last name it is. These two meet at Harvard in the early 20th century, and guess who's president when they meet? Theodore. So everybody in the country knows the last name Roosevelt at this point in time. Okay, but back to the love story. These two meet, they fell in love because they have the same last name and because they are cousins, albeit very distant cousins, they do keep their relationship very much a secret, even from their own families. Even when they got engaged, they told nobody. But Eleanor truly was in love with Franklin and Franklin truly in love with Eleanor. So let's shift the focus a little bit now to Franklin. Franklin Roosevelt grew up a Roosevelt as well, which means he too grew up in a life of privilege. He went to school in these elite private schools. Even at Harvard, many of the other students thought he was kind of stuck up. I mean, he even looked aristocratic. He was tall. He was skinny. When he talked, he had a habit of sticking his chin up in the air and looking down his nose at you while he talked. And I mean, this is just the way he talked. But I'm sure most of the other students were like, oh, how stuck up is that? Franklin, even though he was very outgoing, he didn't have a lot of close personal friends, and Eleanor really was the first true love of his life. So when the two of them met, he fell hard for her. All right, so let's learn a bit, little bit about uh, Franklin's background here. Here are a couple of pictures of the very young Franklin Roosevelt, one with his mom and one with his dad. Now, now let's, let's take a look at these pictures here. Franklin's a little bit older uh, in the photograph on the right with his dad than he is on the, in the photograph on the left with his mom. A little bit older, and probably a few years. But let's look at mom and let's look at dad and consider the age difference between the two of them. And if you think, well, mom looks kind of young for dad, you would be correct. So <laughs> Franklin's mom's name was Sarah Delano. Franklin's dad's name was James Roosevelt. He was known as Squire James because he seemed to be like an English aristocrat. Tall, refined, wealthy, debonair, and he was a horse breeder. Now James had had a wife and a whole other life before he met Sarah, but his first wife and he, they were never able to conceive, so they had no children. So when James meets Sarah, he is looking for a younger woman with whom he can have children. So when they got married, he was exactly twice her age. She was 26. He was 54. So the two of them get married. They have one child, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt's middle name Delano was, of course, his mom's maiden name. Franklin's dad, James, would die when Franklin was 18 years old. His mom would be with him throughout pretty much the rest of his life. In fact, his mom only dies four years before he died, and Sarah was both very protective and very controlling of her son. Think of this. When James died, Sarah inherited a great deal of wealth, and with that wealth, she gave Franklin, who was a, in his late teens at the time, an allowance, and she continued to distribute an allowance to Franklin, helping him to control his finances all the way through the time when he becomes president of the United States of America. So in the case of Franklin and his mom, Sarah, mom is very involved in Franklin's life. And mom, Sarah, was not happy when she found out that her son Franklin had fallen in love and gotten secretly engaged with his distant cousin, Eleanor. So she tried to control this situation by telling Franklin that he was going to go on a very nice cruise. She literally had Franklin put on a cruise ship. This is a vacation liner that she knows is filled with a bunch of young single people like Franklin, hoping that Franklin is going to come to his senses and find some other beautiful young woman from some other wealthy family that he can, you know, get married to. But Franklin was truly in love. And when he came back home from that cruise ship vacation thing, <laughs> he and Eleanor got married. The marriage happened in 1905. And of course, Eleanor's parents are both deceased. And traditionally, it's the dad that walks the daughter down the aisle to give her hand away in marriage. That's how things traditionally work. And of course, Eleanor's dad had long since passed away. So she invited Uncle Theodore to walk her down the aisle. 
Theodore Roosevelt was the President of the United States at the time. And Theodore Roosevelt, being Theodore Roosevelt, he stole the show when he was there. So the wedding of Eleanor and Franklin was dominated by the presence of Theodore Roosevelt. And here's what he did. When he walked Eleanor down the aisle, and everybody's looking at the President of the United States walking, the, walking his niece down the aisle, he leads her up to the altar, he gives her a peck on the cheek, he shakes Franklin's hand, and then he turns around and announces to the whole congregation, there's nothing like keeping the name in the family, laughs out loud and marches off to his seat. Now, as annoying as Theodore Roosevelt probably was at their wedding, these two individuals significantly look up to Theodore Roosevelt and are inspired by him. He's president of the United States of America. He has lived the strenuous life. They both, in various ways, Eleanor and Franklin, wanted to be like Theodore Roosevelt. And certainly the fact that Eleanor's uncle is the president of the United States provides them with this name rep recognition and opportunity to also get involved in politics, especially Franklin. Franklin was genuinely inspired by his distant cousin, Theodore, and he wants to go into politics to be like the next Theodore Roosevelt. Nobody expected that Franklin Roosevelt would be anywhere near as great as Theodore, because Theodore Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt. But Franklin was, in his own way, a young, energetic, idealistic man. He wanted to be like Theodore Roosevelt, only Franklin was slightly different in one particular way. Franklin was very inspired by the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party. And when Franklin got involved in politics and he announces that he is a Democrat, then the next time Theodore Roosevelt was with the young, young Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt walked up to Franklin and said, if you are going to be a Democrat, then you be the best Democrat that, that you can possibly be. So, with his Harvard education, and with his family's many connections, and with his Roosevelt name, Franklin Roosevelt finds a position working for the next Democrat president, President Woodrow Wilson. And get this, how about this for the job that Woodrow Wilson gives to Franklin D. Roosevelt? Roosevelt's job for the Woodrow Wilson administration was this. He was the assistant to the Secretary of the Navy. Yeah, the assistant Secretary of the Navy. So you hear this position and you're like, that sounds familiar. That's what Theodore Roosevelt was at the beginning of the Spanish-American War before, of course, he quit his job and went to Cuba to fight. So does Franklin want to be like his distant, cutty th distant cousin Theodore? You bet. Now, when the United States of America decided to join the First World War, Franklin is helping to run the Navy, so, you know, all those convoy transports that are going across the uh, across the Atlantic. Franklin Roosevelt was helping out with that. And near the end of the war, Franklin Roosevelt himself traveled across the Atlantic Ocean. Eleanor was not with them. The two of them had six children, and Eleanor remained at home with them. Their home, by the way, and Franklin Roosevelt's family, they came from central New York, from a small but very wealthy little town called Hyde Park. It's pretty close to Albany. It's located on the Hudson River. So Eleanor was back home at Hyde Park with the children. Roosevelt spent some time with the military in Europe. And then while he was on the boat ride home, he got very sick. So when he makes it back into port, Eleanor is there to greet him. She takes him home, gets him to bed. And then she takes his suitcases and begins taking out his clothes, starting to do his laundry. And while she's doing that, she comes across a stack of letters. These letters are between Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt's personal secretary, a woman named Lucy Mercer. And it was quite, quite clear from the letters that these two people were romantically involved. This was devastating to Eleanor, especially since her own mom, when she was a little girl, had instilled in her the sense that you're never beautiful enough. You will never attract the right type of man. She thought that all that had washed away when she found Franklin, who was so in love with her, or so she thought. But then she finds out that Franklin's having this fling on the side. She thinks, this is it. I'm going to divorce Franklin. When Eleanor says that she's going to divorce Franklin, in swoops Franklin's mom, Sarah. Don't leave my son. Don't leave my son. Because if you do, and if this scandal is exposed, this will be the end of Franklin Roosevelt's political career. So don't leave my son. So in the end, Eleanor agrees. Franklin apologizes, swears that it will never happen again. And by the way, Lucy Mercer was Eleanor Roosevelt's personal secretary. 
Suffice it to say that Lucy Mercer loses her job and is told to never see the President of the United States again. Okay, so this whole little drama happens. How is it important? Well, Eleanor had spent the last 12 years of her life being sort of the dutiful traditional housewife, but with this breach in the covenant of marriage, she starts to assert herself. She starts to become a little bit more independent. So it was this horrible thing that happened, but Eleanor's response to it was to learn that she couldn't entirely rely upon her husband for love and support. She had to be, to a certain degree, her own independent woman. Now, if the affair itself wasn't bad enough, the rest of the Roosevelt family found out about it, and Theodore Roosevelt's daughter Alice had something to say about it. Remember Alice? She was the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt's first marriage. Her mom died not long after giving birth to her. Theodore Roosevelt said, we're never going to talk about your mom, that you're to address your stepmom as your real mom, as if she's your biological mom. We're not talking about your bi biological mom ever. Is the same Alice that, you know, smoked cigarettes in the White House and upset her dad. Theodore Roosevelt said he could either run the country or try to raise Alice, but he couldn't do both. Yeah, so this Alice. So when the Roosevelt family found out about this affair, Alice Roosevelt's response was this. Well, of course Franklin had an affair. After all, he's married to Eleanor. And Eleanor hears these jabs. And all these things just start to push Eleanor into becoming her own independent person. All right, in 1920. The war is over. Woodrow Wilson is done with his second term. Warren G. Harding is the Republican candidate. The Democratic candidate was the governor of Ohio at the time, a man by the name of James Cox. And Cox chose for his running mate, Franklin Roosevelt. And as you know, the Democrats will lose the presidential election of 1920. Warren G. Harding will come into office and the 1920s will be dominated by the Republican Party. This will be, I believe, the only election that Franklin Roosevelt will lose. But losing this political election, uh, it happens to politicians. He'll learn from it. He'll learn how to be more successful in the future. This was not the big devastating blow that happened to Franklin Roosevelt in the early 1920s. The awful, terrible thing that happened to Franklin Roosevelt, probably the worst thing that happens to him in, in his entire life, I would say likely he would agree to this statement, the worst thing that ever happened to him, happened in August of 1921. He and his family were away from home. They were on vacation. Franklin started feeling extraordinarily sick. High, he had a high fever, which lasted a long time, several days. He was delirious for a while. Franklin D. Roosevelt had contracted polio. Polio was an epidemic disease of the early 20th century. It was a virus that attacked mostly children under the age of five, and it attacked the central nervous system. So when children contracted polio, they sometimes experienced paralysis within hours, and that paralysis was usually permanent. It was an epidemic disease of the early 20th century. The cases of polio really increased dramatically in the middle of the 20th century, 1940s, 1950s, and it wasn't until 1953 that a man by the name of Jonas Salk introduced a polio vaccine. So polio is not something that we have to worry much about today. If you've ever heard of the charity organization, The March of Dimes, that organization started, it began as a way to stop polio and to help the children, mostly children, victims of polio. So polio affected mostly, or attacked mostly children and young children. It was very strange that this disease attacked Franklin Roosevelt, but it did. And he was told he would never walk again. Franklin Roosevelt's mom, Sarah, she was devastated by this, as any mom would be or any parent would be when they found out that their kid had polio, even if their child is a grown man. It's still your child. So Sarah's response was, this is it. You're going to leave politics forever. You've got everything you need to continue to live a comfortable life. You've got a home in Hyde Park. You are financially secure for the rest of your life. You can now just be comfortable, as comfortable as you can. Eleanor's response was different. Eleanor had a pretty keen understanding that her husband's heart was in politics and that he wouldn't feel good about himself unless he was doing something to help the people as a political representative. She knew that the worst thing that he could do is just stay at home and be a, an adult crippled man in a wheelchair and do nothing but live off of his allowance. So she encouraged him to do what he himself wanted to do, which was to exercise, 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 to make himself as physically strong as he possibly could, and to, if he could, 
get his legs to work again. This picture that you're looking at right here is a very rare picture. Part of Franklin Roosevelt's politicking from here on out is going to be to cover up how polio had crippled him. So many of the pictures that you see of Franklin Roosevelt as president of the United States during the Great Depression and World War II, he's either sitting at his desk or sitting in a car. You know, so when he would go around to meet people, he would be in a car and he wouldn't get out of the car. He'd just stay seated in the car. He even had a car built for him that he could uh, control using only hand controls or that he could drive using only hand controls. But then, of course, he's a politician. He's still going to have to give speeches. And so can you imagine this? He had to learn how to hold himself up, hold up his entire body weight using the strength of his arms on the lectern or the podium or wherever he's delivering a speech, which would in and of itself be one heck of a workout, and then smile and deliver this speech. When Franklin Roosevelt had to, quote unquote, walk through a crowd, he would have his bodyguards carry him, and sometimes his sons would do this too, but he still had to fake being upright and swinging his legs a little bit as he was carried through a crowd. I mean, just think about this. Imagine if you have two people that are holding you by your armpits and they are carrying you through a crowd. You need the people carrying you to be extraordinarily strong. And then this is still a physically difficult thing for you to do. And Franklin Roosevelt would do this and he learned to deflect people's attention away from his body by being even more outgoing and charismatic than he already was. So he would smile, he would joke to have people focus on his face. Now, this was a different time in history. I think if this happened today in history, this would be a really difficult thing to conceal with all of the social media and all the press. It was a little bit easier in the 1930s, but Franklin Roosevelt and his personal security worked really hard at keeping this a secret. And even when he became president, and for the most part, Americans knew about his polio, it was something that the press did not focus on, and nor did people really discuss it. It was a little bit of a different time. I think we see a big change in the American culture between the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and today in that regard. And also probably because of the fact that it was polio. Polio was this awful viral disease, and probably everybody knew somebody who had polio, and they were familiar with the ravages of this particular disease. That probably made it easier for people just to shut up about it and be quiet and be respectful of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, especially when he became president of the United States of America. So Franklin Roosevelt worked really hard at his exercises to get his body as strong as he possibly could. And there were some mornings where he was just so worn out and so beaten and so exhausted, both physically and emotionally. He didn't want to try anymore. He didn't want to do these grueling, painful exercises to try to get his body to work anymore. And that's when Eleanor would sort of swoop down and she was a little bit of the coach. She'd give him the pep talk, get him out of bed, say, nope, you're working hard today. Back to the exercises, back to the leg workouts, back to the arm workouts. You are not going to let polio defeat you. Now, after he was stricken with polio, the one place where Franklin D. Roosevelt found a great deal of joy was in a place called Warm Springs, Georgia. In Warm Springs, Georgia, there was a resort and rehabilitation clinic for children with polio. So FDR went there. He spent all this time with children who had polio as an adult man who has polio. And what he does at Warm Springs is enjoy the warm weather of Georgia, and he spends a lot of time swimming. Poor Franklin Roosevelt had to have a, this crane-like apparatus that he would get into on a dock, and he'd spin himself over the edge, have, him, have himself lowered down into the water. And he can't really use his legs very well, but he could use them a little bit to kick himself, but he would mostly swim and tread water and keep himself afloat, and he loved it. He loved it. So I think if you're a swimmer, you can truly appreciate what Franklin is doing for himself here. He simply found joy as well as a lot of good exercise by swimming. In the water, he didn't feel like a cripple. Franklin Roosevelt later said that he tried to cure himself with three things. And these three things were, as Franklin Roosevelt said, swimming, sunshine, and smiles. So swimming at Warm Springs, Warm Springs, Springs, Georgia, you know, it's down in Georgia where it's nice and warm, hence the sunshine and the smiles, just simply staying in a good humor. And what's really cool is, at least for me, what's really cool is Franklin Roosevelt derived a lot of his own personal courage and resilience from children because he was surrounded by all these kids that got hit with 
polio down in Warm Springs. And so here are these kids who are crippled themselves. They'll never walk in their entire lives. And are they beaten down by this? No, they're together. They're kids. They're playing. They're laughing. They're having fun. They're screwing around. They're not feeling bad about themselves. And as an adult man, Franklin Roosevelt looked at these children and he recognized that the children were tougher than he was. So later on, when Warm Springs, Georgia didn't have the finances to stay open and they were going to shut down and the children who were there at Warm Springs at the Rehabilitation Center in Warm Springs, they were going to be sent home. Franklin Roosevelt went to his mom, Sarah, and demanded that she fork over the millions to buy the rehabilitation clinic at Warm Springs, Georgia. She protested, but this is almost our entire savings. Franklin Roosevelt said, I don't care, demanded that mom hand over the money, which she did. And the rehabilitation clinic remained open in Warm Springs, Georgia. Now, I would like to right here, pause the story of Franklin Roosevelt and interject my own personal philosophy about presidential leadership. I believe, as most people do, I think, that throughout the course of American history, there have been great presidents and there have been eh, not so great presidents. Those great presidents are, of course, great leaders, inspirational leaders who know how to respond at a time of crisis to do what's best for the American people. Where does great leadership come from? I believe that one of the elements necessary for great leadership is having yourself gone through a period of extraordinarily extraordinary pain. I don't know if it's possible to be a great leader if you yourself haven't suffered. Now, I don't think suffering is the only element that is needed for great leadership, but what suffering does is it gives you empathy. It helps you to care. It also teaches you personal resilience. Franklin Roosevelt was born a rich, spoiled brat. And really, if you wanted to, he could have been a rich, spoiled brat throughout his entire life. He obviously had some drive in him, probably inspired at least a little bit by his distant cousin Theodore to live a strenuous life, to get involved in politics. But he always knew, up until August of 1921, I'm a Roosevelt. I'm a, I'm a rich, rich man. I don't really have to be here. The world is my oyster. But then along comes polio, and polio literally and figuratively knocks Franklin Roosevelt down. He'll never walk again. Think what it must be like to just lose the function of your legs. Walking, being mobile, something that I think almost all of us just take for granted. We don't even think about it. We need to stand up and walk over to the kitchen or something, walk down the hall, go to the restroom. We walk from class to class to class. We don't think about it. We do it. And then to lose that, to lose that vital function, physically it's going to be difficult. Socially it's going to be difficult. Emotionally it's going to be difficult. You're in a wheelchair. Everybody else is up walking around. This had to have been an extraordinarily difficult thing for Franklin to go through, especially as an adult man. He could have quit politics like his mom wanted him to do, but he doesn't. He doesn't give up. From his suffering, he drew inspiration from children. He found his own inner resilience. And maybe, just maybe this experience helped him to be the best possible president for the United States of America during the Great Depression, when so many Americans were suffering. Maybe this horrible, tragic experience that he went through gave him the knowledge and the insight to do what was best for our country as a whole at that moment. Okay, back to the story. So it's kind of tough for me to go from this touching, sentimental aspect of Franklin Roosevelt from the early 1920s to the middle and late 1920s, where he starts getting back involved in politics. And we'd like to think that, you know, after his first affair, Eleanor deciding finally to stay with him, and then going through the experience of polio and Eleanor helping, out, helping him out so much there, that Franklin would never again stray from his marriage. But he does, and Eleanor discovers it again. Franklin Roosevelt had a personal secretary by the name of Missy Lehand. And Eleanor, once again, discovers through personal correspondences that her husband is most likely having an affair with Missy Lehand. Now, as opposed to the first time when she told her husband never to see Lucy Mercer ever again, Eleanor's response to discovering this particular affair was very different. 
Missy Lehand will remain Franklin Roosevelt's personal secretary for the remainder of her life. She will die in the early 1940s when Franklin Roosevelt is, a, is, is, is the president of the United States. And she... And she herself was very smart, very capable, and actually helped Franklin Roosevelt work through several problems when, I mean, I'm talking political, governmental problems, when she was, her, when she was his, secre- his secretary. In other words, she helped him to run the country, but they were romantically involved too, and Eleanor doesn't do anything to stop it. She just recognizes that her husband is a flanderer. She can't change him. She is disappointed, but this experience, once again, pushes her towards greater independence. On their large estate at Hyde Park, Eleanor has her own house built. It is called Valkill. It's a national park site today. And it was here at Valkill that Eleanor decided she was going to keep her own company and have her own friends and have her own relationships. In particular, she surrounded herself with women who were extraordinarily intelligent. They were interested in the arts, and they were interested in political activism. Here's a picture of Eleanor with two of these women, Marion Dickerman and Nancy Cook. There were also two other friends that Eleanor was really close with. Their names were Esther Lape and Elizabeth Reed. And these women did a lot in terms of philanthropy throughout the 1920s and 1930s, such as establishing a school for girls. And at her residence at Valkill, Eleanor Roosevelt established a furniture shop for some of the unemployed people of New York to come and make furniture and therefore have a job. In the evenings at Valkill, these women would all hang out, have intellectual discussions, and also talk about the various progressive reforms that they were all interested in. In 1928, Franklin was elected governor of New York. So he's back. And as first lady of New York, Eleanor Roosevelt had her own personal bodyguard. His name was Earl Miller. And these two individuals became very close. They would go out swimming together. He taught her how to dive. As a gift, he bought her a horse. They went horseback riding together. They were close. Now, how close were they? Well, we don't know precisely. Even though they wrote hundreds of letters, we don't know what happened to the letters. The letters have disappeared. So we don't know if they were romantically involved But it is quite clear that Eleanor is seeking the emotional and intellectual comfort of other people outside of her marriage. So what you find in the story of Franklin and Eleanor, especially as their relationship develops throughout the 1920s, is that these two people love each other and care for each other, but they definitely have their own separate lives away from the marriage. And this arrangement that they have with their marriage will influence how Franklin Roosevelt runs the country when he he becomes president and also the role that Eleanor will play as First Lady of the United States. Had the two of them had a more traditional marriage and relationship, I don't know if Eleanor Roosevelt would have been the very progressive activist First Lady that she was in the 1930s and 1940s. All right, and back to the 1920s. Stuff that you have learned many times over. 1920s are dominated by the Republicans. President Warren G. Harding from 1921 to 1923. President Calvin Coolidge from 1923 to 1929. And the 1928 election, Herbert Hoover is elected the president of the United States of America. The 20s are dominated by the Republican Party. In my own humble opinion, the person who's really running the country, though, is Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon because of how he fostered a culture of buying on credit, and in particular, buying stocks on credit, which we call buying on the margin, which people did in droves in the 1920s until it all came crashing down in October of 1929. Fearful that the prices of stocks had been overly inflated with too many people buying stocks with money that they did not have, with money that they borrowed from a bank on a loan. Foreign investors started pulling out first. This led to others skeptical that there was a bubble, pulling out their money next, then a rush to sell stocks and the stock market crashes, then a rush to pull your savings out of the banks, and then many banks go bankrupt. So by the time we enter into 1930, the situation is dire. And the president of the United States of America, who, let's remember, had only been president for about eight months when this happened, he's the one left holding the reins on the country. And what does he do? Well, he's a Republican. The Republicans aren't one to support a whole lot of government intervention. The business of America is business. The business of America is not 
government taking care of you. So Hoover knows this is horrible, understands the economic catastrophe that has just happened, but he repeatedly asserts that it will be American capitalism that will solve this crisis. It will not be the American federal government. Now, Herbert Hoover did do one thing, one significant thing, to try to alleviate the effects of the Great Depression, which is that he raised tariffs. So in other words, there were high taxes placed on goods that were being imported in the United States of America. And the purpose of this was to generate more manufacturing within the United States of America. So this was called the Holly Smoot Tariff Act of 1930. And it's supposed to work like this. Like, um, let's take shoes, for example. With this tariff, all of the shoes that we're importing, you know, foreign shoes, with this tariff act, they're going to become really expensive. So you're not going to buy those shoes. You're going to buy the American-made shoes. And so that'll generate more, you know, shoe manufacturing here in the United States of America. But sadly, the Holly Smoot Tariff Act didn't work, and many Americans really develop a negative opinion of Herbert Hoover. They wanted, many Americans wanted the federal government to do something, to protect them from foreclosures, from evictions, to provide jobs, to provide some sort of economic opportunity. Four years into Herbert Hoover's administration, 1932, the United States hits record unemployment, 25%, which is the highest level of unemployment ever in American history. And it's a number that I hope we never see again. However, just want to state right here, 25% unemployment, as horrible as that is in 1932, United States of America. In 1932, Germany, the unemployment rate was 60%. 60% unemployment in 1932, Germany. And that horrible economic condition in Europe was a major reason for the rise of fascism. All right, but now let's just stay over here in the United States of America. What are people doing? How are people surviving? 25% unemployment. People kicked out of their homes. People have had their farms repossessed. Homeless rates are staggering. Well, in this situation, many men became hobos. They traveled around from town to town to town trying to get jobs. So many of them would ride the rails. That's what you see going on here. These guys are not ticket-paying passengers on the railroad. They hop the trains. It takes a little while for a train to get up the momentum to get moving fast. So if you find out that there's a train going to, I don't know, Indianapolis, and you think there might be jobs in Indianapolis, you wait outside the train station, you know, a few hundred yards down the track. When that train gets going, you run up to it, you jump on it. It's not necessarily particularly safe, but it's going to get you where you need to go. So if you're an unemployed, especially an unemployed man, a lot of times you'd become a hobo. A lot of times, you know, when you would go to a different town, you were following a rumor. You heard that there might be jobs available in Indianapolis, in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, something like that. So you jump on the train, try to get up. You get up there only to find that, well, there are no more jobs here than there are back home. And there's this incredible sense of desperation that develops among these hobos, among these men. So if you were one of these unfortunate hobos who was moving around from town to town to town, and you found yourself mostly traveling through rural America, then you would probably start picking up on some of these codes. Hobos would leave marks like these on trees and on fences as helpful indicators for future hobos traveling that way. These marks would indicate such things as whether or not a road was safe or not. Many of them deal with homes. So for example, if you find the picture of the cat on here, a drawing of a cat like that was an indicator that a kind lady lives in this particular home. If you look at the cross near the bottom right of this image, you see that a cross signifies that you go to the owners of this home and you talk about religion, or rather you maybe identify yourself as a devout Christian, that that religious talk might get you a free meal. So hobos develop their own secret code to help each other out. Now in the cities, you tended to have this. So many people were evicted from their homes in the early 1930s that the homeless started conglomerating in city parks or undeveloped property in downtown urban areas. And they'd create their own shanty town. And here's where they'd live, sometimes as individuals, sometimes families. Of course, no running water, no electricity, no heat, aside from whatever you could burn. It was a pretty tough existence. These shanty towns were commonly referred to as Hoovervilles, another indicator that people were rather upset with the president and blamed him for this whole economic disaster. Even though Hoover had little to nothing to do with the stock market crash of 1929, and I think I will go so far as to say as he had nothing to do with the stock market crash of 1929, 
people were upset with his lack of response and seeming lack of empathy for the people who were suffering so much. Now, these shanty towns or Hoovervilles had the reputation of being these very, very dangerous places. And this makes sense because think of who's living here. People without jobs, people who cannot find opportunity. There's a lot of desperation in this Hooverville. And everybody needs food. Everybody needs to have a little bit of money. You have all these homeless people living together. It's not hard to imagine. This would be an excellent breeding ground for gangs. Get a few guys together, maybe get a gun, go rob a store, get some money, and then come back and disappear into the Hooverville. So you might also be able to imagine that Hooverville would be a place where the police were not necessarily welcomed. Likely the police would have been seen as individuals guarding the established authority, and many of the people who lived here are just simply desperate. The Hoovervilles were also a breeding ground for radical ideas, communism, possibly anarchism, and with so many people unemployed, 25%. By 1932, the idea of a communist revolution was a very real and significant growing idea here in the United States of America. And this is the lesson that we learn from history. If ever you have a country where a significant number of people are living in poverty, and the wealth of that co country is concentrated into a small minority, and there is a very small mean middle class in between those two socioeconomic groups, then that's pretty much the formula for revolution. The 1930s were a very dangerous time, and that's worth keeping in the back of your mind as you learn about Franklin Roosevelt's administration, and what he, when he becomes president, has to respond to. This growing sentiment that, with millions of unemployed, if the government doesn't take care of us, we will rise up against the government. There was a lot of desperation and anger during the Great Depression. All right, so <laughs> this silly little image here. So shanty towns were called Hoovervilles, and if you had no money, you could show that you had no money by pulling your pockets inside out of your pants, and those were called Hoover flags. Just another indicator of how frustrated the, some of the American people were with Herbert Hoover and the United States federal government as a whole. Now, on the other side of the earth, in the Soviet Union, they are over 10 years into their experiment in creating a country with complete economic equality and all business and manufacturing owned and controlled by the government, the Soviet Union is not suffering from any type of Great Depression. So the American Great Depression, it starts with the stock market crash in 1929, and then it quickly spreads around the world. I mentioned Germany. Germany had 60% unemployment in 1932. It was hitting France and England pretty hard as well. So the ripples of the Great Depression spread nearly everywhere in the Western world, but it did not affect the Soviet Union with their highly socialized economic structure. There was 100% employment in the Soviet Union because this model of government, which doesn't provide you a great deal of economic freedom, it does ensure that the government will give you a job. And so during the Great Depression, there is a sense that, okay, maybe this communist model that the Soviets are pursuing, maybe this is the better model. And the longer the Great Depression goes on, honestly, the better the Soviet Union looks. 1932 is the only year in American history where emigration was greater than immigration. In other words, more people were leaving than were coming into the country. That is a rare thing in American history. And where many Americans were choosing to go was the Soviet Union. Stateside, here in the United States of America, there was a growing communist movement, there were general strikes, and there were a variety of protests, all of which seemed aimed at having government do something to provide relief for the people. And this particular image here of these men protesting and this particular banner, it seems to say it all and really captures the spirit of what's going on in the early 1930s. Work or riot, one or the other. These are men who are begging for jobs. They're not lazy. They're not looking for a handout. They don't want any type of direct financial assistance like a welfare check. What they want is the opportunity to work and to get paid for work. But that work is not available. And if nothing is done, then there's the real poten potential for riot, for people rising up to attack businesses and stores and steal money and, 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 and get food or whatever else people need. The most famous protest of the early 1930s and probably throughout the entirety of the Great Depression was the protest that happened in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1932. This was the Bonus Army. 
Here's who these individuals were, and here's what happened. The Bonus Army, their full name was the Bonus Expeditionary Force, or the BEF. They were all World War I veterans. Now, it's important to know that the way the army operated and how the army treated its soldiers and its veterans in the First World War is very different from the way the army operates today and how the army treats its veterans today. And when I say the army, I mean all of the armed forces. So back during World War I times, when you were a soldier, you served in the military, and then when you were done, you were done. The United States military cut off all obligation to you at the same time that you were done fighting for the United States military. So in other words, you came back home from France, you were done with the army, you were discharged, and then that's it. The army owes you nothing. It gives you nothing. No health assistance, no pension, you know, no medical plan, no education scholarships, none of that stuff. And that stuff does exist today, at least to a certain degree it ex exists today. There are veteran benefits today, but those didn't exist during the time of the First World War. Well, at some point in time in the 1920s, Congress passed legislation to give the veterans of the First World War a bonus check. The economy was doing so well in the 1920s that this fund was established by Congress and the United States Treasury so that a bonus check would be distributed to every living American veteran of the First World War in the year 1945. And that was all very well and good in the 1920s. But then along comes the Great Depression. And the veterans are suffering like everybody else during the Great Depression. Many of them have lost their jobs, their homes, and they're reaching a state of desperation. So the Bonus Expeditionary Force was established. The Bonus Army. They drove, hopped the trains, or some of them walked to the nation's capital. And they went there to put pressure on Congress to pass legislation to release those bonus checks now, not in 1945. A lot of them genuinely felt that they're not going to make it another 13 years to 1945. They need those bonus checks now. Okay, so here you see them as the bonus army in the summer of 1932. This would be July of 32. They're in front of the Capitol building. And for the legislation to pass, you know, it's going to have to start first with the House of Representatives, and then it's going to, to, going to have to go to the Senate, and then the president will have to sign off on it. And if all those things happen, then the bonus army gets their bonus checks early. Okay, so before I get into the story of what happened, it helps to know where the bonus army is geographically in Washington, D.C. So here's a screenshot I took of Washington, D.C. as it is today. Thank you, Google. And you see there in the middle of the screen is the United States Capitol, which is, of course, where the Bonus Army would go to protest the politicians. And these World War I veterans were very well organized. They divided up into small groups. They went into the Capitol, and two or three of them would just sit and wait for each member of Congress outside of their individual offices to talk to them about their lives and about how they needed this money. And there would be all of these demonstrations going on around the Capitol, so that the politicians would have to deal with the veterans. And these are veterans. These are people who fought for their country, who saw men die. These are the veterans that saved the world for democracy. And these are men who are now, a lot of them, homeless, or at least in a, in a, in a very desperate situation, so much so that they have the ability to come to D.C. because they don't have a job back home, and this is their last resort. So, hey, politicians, we veterans saved America and the world. Now, please help us just a little bit. So that's what they're doing in the Capitol. Now, you see here on this map of Washington, D.C., there's two rivers that flow together. On the left-hand side, that's the Potomac River. And then the other river on the right-hand side of this image is the Anacostia River. And it was across the Anacostia River at Anacostia Park. I think it was called the Anacostia Flats back then. That's where the Bonus Army set up a camp. So they were ac across the river from the capital. So where the Bonus Army is camped out becomes important to the very end of the story. It's important to know that these veterans were not living at the state capital. They were across the Anacostia River in Anacostia, where they set up this camp. And this camp was kind of an amazing thing. These veterans built these small little homes, so they sort of wanted their camp to look nice, so it wasn't like this ugly-looking shantytown. They built their shacks to look like miniature suburban homes. They had a town center. There was a library that they established. They held sporting events, mostly boxing matches. And 
The bonus army camp was integrated. There were both blacks and whites that were there, and they weren't segregated from each other. They were living together side by side. Okay, so how did this go? So first, the bonus army petitions the House of Representatives, and it works. They get the House of Representatives to present a bill to the House of Representatives to issue the bonus checks early to the veterans of the First World War. The House of Representatives allowed for a few of the veterans to come to the House floor to speak. One of the veterans who spoke was a man by the name of Joe Angelo. We'll, le we'll learn a little bit more about him here in a minute. And he gave a very, very eloquent speech. And he and these other veterans really convinced the House of Representatives that the, these men out there who need a little help are heroes, that they step forward to save their country and really the world in a time of need. It's the least this government can do is to give them a bonus check. So the bonus army bill resoundingly passes the House, and then it goes to the Senate. And this picture that you see right here on this slide is of the bonus armies camped, uh, camped out holding vigil all night while the Senate was in session, because if the Senate passes this bill, then it essentially it's going to get issued. But the Senate didn't pass the bill by a fairly substantial margin, too. The bonus army is not going to get their bonus checks until 1945, as it was decided by the United States Senate in July 1932. The bonus army was a calm, peaceful demonstration around the Capitol building. But at the time of the Senate's deliberations, the Bonus Army had completely surrounded the Capitol building. They were singing songs, patriotic songs. And so after, after the decision was made, the senators had to be snuck out of the Capitol building through underground passageways. The announcement was made to the Bonus Army that the, that the bill did not pass the Senate. And there was obviously a great deal of dismay, but there was no violence. Nobody was throwing bricks through windows or anything. Many of the Bonus Army protesters went back to Anacostia Flats. Some of them, but it was only a minority of them, left the camp and they went back home. And the size of the Bonus Army was reduced from about 15,000 veterans to 11,000 veterans. But most of them didn't leave Anacostia because they didn't have any homes to go home to. They were homeless. They had established this camp here with other, other veterans. They were going to stay in Washington, D.C. And even after the bill was rejected, there were continued demonstrations and parades throughout Washington, D.C. for the United States federal government to do something for the veterans. But the continued presence of the veterans in Washington, D.C., demanding that the United States federal government do something to help them, started to agitate the president, Herbert Hoover, who didn't really understand why aren't the veterans going home. He really didn't understand that they don't have any homes to go home to. They're stuck here. They, got, they have nothing else that they can do. And then the agitation began. Some of the veterans started moving into half-demolished, empty buildings. And they were living there. They essentially squatted these buildings. But these buildings are still private property. And the Washington, D.C. police came to remove the veterans from the property. Now, when the police showed up, things were relatively peaceful. But then somebody, one of the veterans, started throwing bricks at the police. And the police then started trying to remove the men by force. And then the conflict grew violent, like you see in this particular picture here. You see the veterans mostly on the left and the police mostly on the right. The police are trying to force the veterans off this property. So guys, think about this. This is a showdown between the Washington police force and First World War veterans, cops versus vets. This is a terrible moment in United States history where veterans, war veterans, and law enforcement officers are forced into a conflict with each other in our nation's capital, no less. So what was the result of this scuffle? Well, the police eventually retreated and the veterans held their ground. But now we've had a physical confrontation and the police were assaulted. Never mind that they were assaulted by veterans. They were still assaulted and the Bonus Army is taking over public and private spaces in Washington, D.C. Herbert Hoover feels like he has to do something about this, so he calls in the active United States Army. The highest-ranking Army commander, another First World War veteran, and a veteran of the American invasion of Mexico, 
that's when we invaded Vera, Veracruz and, and marched into Mexico City, not Pancho Villa's invasion of Mexico. A veteran of both of these conflicts and the current highest ranking member, highest ranking commander of the United States military. <laughs> I keep screwing up my terms here. The highest ranking commander of the United States Army. His name was Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur is called in by Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover gives Douglas MacArthur specific instructions. He wants for MacArthur to clear out the bonus army from downtown Washington, D.C. He also tells Douglas MacArthur not to cross over the bridge going over the Anacostia River into the camp. So in other words, get them out of D.C., but don't go into their camp. These are the instructions given to Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur brought with him a subordinate commander. His name was Dwight D. Eisenhower. If you're at all familiar with the United States military during World War II, you knew that these are two very big names of the Second World War, General Eisenhower and General MacArthur. And they were both present in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1932 and were responsible for clearing out the Bonus Army. And again, let's just take a moment to think about what's happening here. This is a conflict like never before in American history, where you have war veterans, not just veterans, but veterans of battle, veterans of the worst conflict in world history, the First World War, versus the active United States Army. And commanding those, the, the Army are men who are also World War I veterans. Dwight Eisenhower also fought in the First World War. This is a horrible situation where you have vets fighting active service personnel. And think, you know, if you are actually in the army at this point in time and you are shipped to Washington, D.C., and you're told to clear out these military veterans, these guys who are a little bit older than you, but actually fought in the First World War. And chances are, if you're a soldier at this point in time, you know, unless you're a commanding officer, you probably haven't seen the face of battle like these veterans that you're going to face. These are American veterans. How do you how do you confront them? How do you fight them? How do you push them out of Washington, D.C.? Could you do this in good conscience, even if your commanding officer tells you to do it? So what's interesting is how MacArthur handles this situation. General, General MacArthur tells his men, tells his soldiers, that reconnaissance work has been done with this so-called bonus army. And in fact, there are a significant number of men who claim to be veterans in this camp who are not veterans, but who are rather communist agitators. MacArthur tells his men that these individuals who are squatting on land in Washington, D.C., they're here to overthrow the government. They're here to start a revolution. They're communists. They're Bolsheviks. They want the USA to be like the USSR. This is what MacArthur tells his men. And these are all lies. But this is how MacArthur was able to inspire his men to fight war veterans in good conscience. Here's what happened next. To clear out the veterans from downtown Washington, D.C., the active military first used tear gas. So the war veterans were literally choked out of downtown Washington, D.C. If you take a look at this particular image right here, you have the active service personnel wearing their gas masks. They've got their rifles with bayonets affixed and the Bonus Army's veterans, the Bonus Army veterans with eyes and skin stinging from the tear gas begin their retreat to their camp in Anacostia. So back to our map here. The Bonus Army goes back to Anacostia. They cross the bridge. MacArthur leads his army up to the bridge. Now, remember, Herbert Hoover gave very specific orders. Get the Bonus Army out of downtown D.C. Do not go over to Anacostia. Hoover just wants to keep them on the other side of this river. But MacArthur leads his army up to the bridge with bayonets affixed to rifles, a cavalry with swords drawn, and with World War I-era tanks. MacArthur, even though he's reminded that he is not to go into Anacostia, leads his army into Anacostia, proclaiming, as he says, I cannot bother with pieces of paper during a military operation. This style of leadership is definitive of General MacArthur. General MacArthur does a very poor job of listening to the President of the United States. This is not the last time he will behave in this manner. He is a fantastic military commander whose job is to win conflicts, and he likes to win conflicts absolutely. 
and MacArthur, as you will see both here in 1932 and a little bit later on in history in 1950, he tends to just disregard the orders that are given to him by the President of the United States. And remember, the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of all of our military forces. So MacArthur is going to disobey his boss. So MacArthur leads the military across the bridge into Anacostia, and they burn the Bonus Army camp down so that there is nothing left and no place for the Bonus Army to live in Washington, D.C. And now these desperate men and their families simply have to go find somewhere else, anywhere else, to try to live. For General MacArthur, he did his job. President Herbert Hoover never condemned the action of General MacArthur. President Herbert Hoover also noted that night that he could see the fires from Anacostia from his bedroom window at the White House. Here's one of the Bonus Army marchers, Joe Angelo. He's one of the few bonus marchers, excuse me, bonus army marchers who got to speak before the House of Representatives, inspiring them to pass the bill to get the bonus checks to the veterans. Joe Angelo had received the Distinguished Service Cross, which you see on his chest right there. He received this in the First World War for saving the life of another soldier by the name of George Patton. George Patton was another First World War veteran who continued his military service, who had also in the intermediary years, worked his way up through rank and command. George Patton was also present and with the army during the expulsion of the Bonus Army. And of course, George Patton, very similar to Eisenhower and MacArthur, would go on to become very, very famous during the Second World War. So Joe Angelo, after seeing all the houses burned down and all the veterans displaced, he goes to try to find Patton because he knows Patton is there. Now he has saved the life of General Patton. So he goes up to the United States Army, finds George Patton, and he wants to talk one-on-one -on -one with this individual whose life he saved during the First World War. When Patton saw him, George Patton turned to a subordinate officer and said, take this man away, I never want to see him again. The treatment of the Bonus Army inspired a song that became very popular in the 1930s. It's a song about being an American and working hard. And when, you, when your country needs you, you come to the service of your country. But when times get extraordinarily rough, how your country doesn't necessarily return the favor. The title of this song was Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? And the voice of this song, the perspective of this song, was that of the Bonus Army in 1932. And the lyrics go like this. They used to tell me I was building a dream, and so I followed the mob. When there was earth to plow or guns to bear, I was always there, right on the job. They used to tell me I was building a dream with peace and glory ahead. Why should I be standing in line, just waiting for bread? Once I built a railroad, I made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? The treatment of the Bonus Army did not bode well for the reputation and the image of the President of the United States, Herbert Hoover. So several months later, in, 19, in November of 1932, Herbert Hoover lost fairly decisively against the Democratic candidate for the President of the United States, who was then the governor of the state of New York, Franklin D. Roosevelt. While the Bonus Army incident was happening, Franklin Roosevelt had been campaigning around the United States of America, promising that if they elected him President of the United States, he would treat them differently. His distant cousin Theodore Roosevelt, while he was president, said that he was giving the Americans a square deal where everybody would be treated equally because all sides of a square are equal. But now Franklin Roosevelt comes along, he alters the slogan, and he says the time has come for a new deal that government should be somehow altered, improved, made better, made new. Now, Franklin Roosevelt doesn't really disclose any details while he's campaigning. And as a presidential candidate or as a political candidate, you probably don't want to disclose too much in terms of your plan, because if you do, then potentially your adversaries take those specific details and explain to the American people how they won't work. So best just to keep it general and vague and hopeful and optimistic. 
And that's what people wanted to hear in 1932, is that there would be a new president who would be different from Herbert Hoover, who was mostly a do-nothing president, and that this new president would do something to actively help the people of the United States of America to recover from the ravages of the Great Depression. And that's what FDR does. He offers the American people a new deal. So when November of 1932 comes around, the reign of the Republicans is over. The Republican Party had dominated the United States government and throughout the 1920s. In 1933, President Roosevelt, President Franklin Roosevelt, or FDR, becomes president, and the Democrats will control the White House for the next 20 years. It won't be until 1953 that a Republican will become president of the United States again. And hey, that Republican is an individual I just mentioned a little bit earlier ago, Dwight Eisenhower. Franklin Roosevelt is inaugurated in early March of 1933. The first thing he does is, of course, do what most presidents do, give a speech that will set the tone for his presidency and provide an optimistic view of the next four years. This was especially important during the Great Depression. It was during his first inaugural address that President Roosevelt proclaimed famously, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. All right, so President Roosevelt has said that he is going to deliver to the Americans a new deal. But what the new deal is, people don't know yet. He's delivered a speech that is equally vague, although optimistic. And he says the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But now that he's president of the United States of America, he's got some serious work to do. And he actually has to do something to help the American people. So now let's learn about the New Deal. Hello again, United States history students. Hey, we're not going to jump into the New Deal just yet. I've split up the lecture on the 1930s into two parts. So we will learn all about the New Deal and how President Franklin Roosevelt is going to try to save the United States of America from the Great Depression in the next lecture on part two in the 1930s. I'll see you then. Have a wonderful day.